Blessed morning, everyone. Come, let us open with a word of prayer. Our Lord, our God, we praise you for you are truly the Lord who is close to us. And today, even as we enter into your sanctuary, Lord, may you prepare our hearts now to receive your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we have been preaching through the book of Revelation uh, since last year, right? And we've been trying to do this on a weekly basis. So now we are here at chapter 14. And Revelation is a episode, a letter that's written by John, the apostle, the beloved uh, disciple of Jesus Christ. And he's probably written Revelation in his old age and when he was exiled into the Isle of Patmos, right? And actually here, as we come to chapter 14, John is he's going to challenge us to make a choice. Okay, he's going to challenge us to make a choice. And if you just briefly skim through the whole of chapter 14, you will find that it's pretty much of a division. Right? From verse 1 to 5, you will kind of read about the remnant. Right? There's 144,000 the people of God who stood against the evil and suffering in the earlier chapters of chapter 12 and 13. And then from chapter 6 to 20, there's this image of a horrible judgment that's coming down on the rest of humanity. And so the trust, or rather the main point of this whole passage is this. Which group do you want to belong to? Which group do you want to belong to? And are you ready? Are you ready to face the coming end? Are you ready to be harvested? So let's begin. Let's read our passage. Uh, I'm just going to start off with reading five verses, verse 1 to verse 5. And I'm reading this in the English Standard Version. Then I look, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of a harpies playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever they go, wherever He goes. It is these who have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. You know, here we kind of see that uh, the vision has changed, it has shifted, right? It's turning away from the horrific images of the beast as what we see from chapter 13. And now we see someone else setting the stage, the lamb. And this lamb is the real, okay, the real lamb of God. It's not a fake lamb. Uh, it's not like what Pastor Robert reminded us in chapter 13, the, the beast that is the Antichrist. No, but this Lamb of God was introduced to us in chapter 5, right? He's the one who emerges from the throne to open the scroll, the only one who is worthy, the Lamb that is Jesus Christ. And so here we see the Lamb, our Lord Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, and with Him surrounded, right, 144,000 who have His name and the Father's name written on their foreheads. Now, a little bit of a recap. Who are the 144,000? Now, there is a one view that say that, okay, this must be a subset of Christians, right? Maybe they are the martyred Messianic Jews during the Great Tribulation. Or they, are, they must be a group of very holy people. They must be saints or desert monks. Because you know why? Verse 4 and 5 say that they are virgins. Right, virgins, and they must be, and their first fruits to God. So definitely they must be monks or something. But I don't agree with that, right? And I instead I want to posit that the 144,000 represent the redeemed believers from every age and generation. So let me show you how. Now, 144,000 is 
12 times 12, and then, okay, 144 is 12 times 12, right? The old covenant is represented by 12 tribes, the new covenant by the 12 apostles. So 12 times 12 is 144, times 10, times 10, times 10, right? 10 raised to the power of three, which is a tree is a symbol of the Trinity. And 10 is an indication in the Old Testament, in, uh, indicating numbers, uh, many in that sense. So together, this number, uh, perfection of 12 times 12 times 10 times to the power of three is symbolic of the redeemed believers of every age and generation. It is not a literal, literal number of any subset of Christians, whether Jew or otherwise. So we read from the text, right? These redeemed believers, what are they doing? They were like the harpies. They were making music before the throne, the four living creatures, the elders, and they were singing this new song. Okay, and this is not the first time actually we, we came across this singing of a new song, right? We saw it earlier in chapter five, verse nine, when the Lamb of God, Jesus, emerged from the throne to take the scroll. There was a new song that was sung then, right? And here, another new song. Now, whenever a new song is sung, okay, it means it's a new act of conquest, okay? It's a new song of praise. And here we need to note that only those who were sealed by the Father, bought by the blood of Christ, can learn and sing this new song. They are owned by God. They have the mark of the Father written on their foreheads. And we are going to see a contrast, right? We are going to see between these people who have the mark of the Father versus those who don't have. Because later on, they who don't have will face the wrath of God. And so we kind of come to a choice, right? You either face the wrath of the beast in chapter 13, or you wait to face the wrath of God later on in chapter 14. And you need to choose because the harvest is coming. And so we read the redeemed they were standing here. And we notice where they are standing. They are standing on Mount Zion. Now, this is not the physical, the earthly Mount Zion, which is the physical Jerusalem in Israel, but the heavenly Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, as what we can see in Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. Now, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul tells us to take the image figuratively. He tells us that the old covenant represents the present city of Jerusalem, but the new covenant represents the Jerusalem that is free, that is above. And similarly, we look at this in Joel chapter 3, chapter 2, verse 32, that when he prophesies that everyone who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, and then he mentioned about Mount Zion and, and Jerusalem, he doesn't mean that only when people call upon those names in those cities or those areas will be saved, but deliverance will be granted to everyone was redeemed under the new covenant of grace, right? In every nation, tribe, tongue, and language, tongue and people. And Hebrews 12 tells us that all of them, that is all of us, will be gathered to the heavenly Jerusalem where we will gather around the throne in Jesus' name. And this vision we will see a few sermons later in Revelation 21 and 22. Okay, now we come to the, to the tough part, right? What about the part that talk about them being virgins and that they have never defiled themselves with women? What does that mean? If we take this 144,000 to represent uh, believers from every age and every generation, then what could this mean? Does it mean only people who are celibate are saved? What does it mean? Okay, now, if this is taken literally, okay, I think it will be very offensive to about half of the congregation here okay, to say that women, hey, you defile the man. And it will also sound not very biblical because then Genesis tells us that it is not good for a man to be alone. Moreover, in Hebrews 13, and also in our Let's Talk About Sex workshop yesterday, I think Mr. Gung reminded us that if marriage is honoured, if the marriage bed is kept pure, sex, is not dirty or defouling. So could they, okay, so if that is the case, then 
Are we talking about celibacy then? Is this what Paul is telling us about in, in 1 Corinthians 7, that being single-minded, you know, that these are the advantages of being a celibate, of being celibate. But if we read carefully in 1 Corinthians 7, we will see that marriage is called a gift, just as how celibacy is also called a gift. If you are single, you have the gift of celibacy. But when you get married, you exchange that gift for a gift of equal worth, the gift of marriage. And Paul also defended marriage to say that it is protection against temptation. And while he himself was celibate, he did not insist on everyone to follow him. So if this phrase did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgin, it's not talking about sex being a defiling act, nor is it talking about celibacy. Then what can it mean? Now, I'm sure all of you remember our previous sermons, and in one of those sermons, we allude to how, you know, revelation or, or apocryphic literature is, they have a lot of OT, uh, Old Testament allusion, right? So, for example, in the Old Testament, Israel is often referenced to the virgin daughter of Zion, right? That's how Israel was referenced to. And then in Hosea, we, you see the reference being used about how God is supposed to be the husband, Israel is like the bride. And so this same imagery is, is transferred to the New Testament. So in the New Testament, Christ is the groom, right? And the church, the bride. And Paul wrote this in Corinthians when he urges us to keep ourselves pure until the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will truly be united with Christ our Lord. And I think that's the meaning behind the 144,000 okay, who are not defiling themselves with women and remaining virgin. It is to say that these people have been faithful. They did not commit spiritual adultery. Okay? They did not take the mark of the beast. Despite their suffering, despite the trials in their life, they confess that Christ is still their Lord. Now, by no means am I saying these people are perfect but they entrusted themselves to the perfect Jesus and they are eagerly waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb. They are faithful, right? Now, secondly, the verse also tells us that they are people who follow Jesus. This is discipleship, denying themselves and following Christ. And thirdly, it also describes them as people who are purchased and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. Now, I need to go a bit to talk about the first fruit. In the Old Testament, first fruits refer to the first portion of any harvest that is dedicated to God as an offering. So we see this in the Feast of the First Fruits, where first fruits are offered up to God as thanksgiving for the rest of the harvest. But in the New Testament, first fruits are used to describe believers who are set apart or dedicated to God. See this in James chapter 1, verse 18, as well as Romans chapter 9, verse 23. And so the moment when you claim that promise and you say, I present my body as a living sacrifice to God, that is the first fruit of yourself being offered up to Him, where you deny yourself and say that I don't belong to me, but I belong to you. That's the meaning of first fruits. And the fourth thing that John say about the redeemed here is that in their mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. They tell the truth. We tell the truth about God, about who the Messiah is, about how we are reconciled to God through faith in Christ, even though sometimes saying the truth now may not be accepted by people. You know, today in our postmodern society, I think every one of us, we want to have a claim on personal truth, right? We say, this is us. Subjective truth. Okay, you know, you believe this one. This is your truth, lah, subjective to you. But this is my subjective truth, right? But while there is admittedly subjective truth, there is also objective truth, right? Objective truth are truths that are common to you and me, which we cannot deny. Things like gravity. Okay, I cannot say, I don't believe in gravity. And the moment I say I don't believe in gravity, I start floating. No, 
Doesn't make sense, right? No matter whether you believe or not, you are bound to that truth. So there is objective truth in Christianity and we can, in some measure, know it and defend it. So one of the objective truths which I mentioned before, before was covered in our Easter sermon was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there's no resurrection, why believe that Christ has resurrected, has raised? And if Christ has not raised, then the apostles are liars, witnesses are false, all Christians are still lost in their sin. So the issue is, is the resurrection true or not? Is it an objective truth? Because ultimately, the reason for us to become a Christian is because Christianity is objective truth to us. Right? It's not because some of our members or some of our family members are Christians and you want to join them. It's not because Christianity helped you to become a more moral person or good person. And it's not because, because the church here, the people are warm. But ultimately, because you believe in the objective truth that Jesus has raised from the dead. And if you are convicted of that, then you need to tell people of this truth. That's what the redeemed will do on those last days, proclaiming the truth of the scripture and the good news of the gospel. Will you speak the truth? Will you choose to speak the truth? Because the harvest is coming. Now, we have talked about, you know, the very nice, beautiful side. And now we come to the division, right? We come to the next part, which is, from verse 6 to 20. And here we have a more dark vision of God's judgment, or a more depressing vision of God's judgment. And that of the angels and of the harvest, we will see a lot about God's wrath here. You know, judgment will happen. And as we, what we can often read about in Revelation, judgment happened in the form of God's wrath being poured out upon the people, upon people who are rebellious to him. Now, why is God wrathful? Why is he angry? You know, he's not angry because he didn't get enough sleep, because he had a bad morning, or because his feelings are hurt. But his anger, his wrath, is an intrinsic characteristic of himself. It is something, just as how love is, right? And wrath is the outworking of his holiness when he confronts sinful rebellion. You know, when you look at a newspaper, you just flip. And sometimes we come across some news that really shock us, right? Some hideous acts of murder. I remember reading about how this man abuses and then he kills off his daughter and then kills off his wife. And it's all of pure pettiness or pure selfishness. Now, what happens when you read about such a story? Actually, you feel anger. You feel that something is wrong, right? Your hearts are filled with righteous anger. And you long, actually, for justice to be served. And imagine this, that we are people who are not holy. We are people who are not holy. And yet, in witnessing an act of evil, we respond in such a way. Can you imagine God, who is thrice holy, how will he respond when he sees the wickedness that's in us, in our minds, in our thoughts, in our hearts? Have we hated people? If you do, that's murder. Have you lasted outside of your marriage? If you have, that's adultery. Have you prioritized your children, your career, your wealth, above God. If you have, that's idolatry. And yet, God's wrath is often balanced with His mercy and grace. And we see this in the giving of His Son, Jesus, to us. But for those who persist in rejecting Him, who continue to turn away from the Holy One to sin and wickedness, they will stand under the wrath of God. That's what we will see here in verse 6 to 13. The first angel summons all of mankind to fear God and to worship Him. We read from the passage that the angel had the eternal gospel to proclaim 
And he said this in a very loud voice, right? He said, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. And this is what the angel will tell the world to do. The angel holds the objective truth of the everlasting good news. And this is good news for Muslims in the Arab world, for Buddhists in the Southeast Asia, for Hindus in, in India, for atheists in Europe. But on one hand, while he preaches the good news, he also announces judgment. And the judgment is for all to give glory to God and to worship him willingly in this life or be compelled to give glory to him later. Remember Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, that reminds us that in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in a sense, when that happened, that would be a fulfillment of Matthew 24, verse 14, that the gospel is preached to all the world before Christ returns. The second angel in verse 8 say that Babylon had fallen. And this is drawn from the Old Testament. The imagery is drawn from Old Testament that talks about how Babylon is a representation of the wicked world that rejects God and everything that it stood for. Right? In Jeremiah 51 verse 7, it says that Babylon was like a golden cup in, in the Lord's hand, but it's making all the earth drunk. The nations drink of a wine and all the nations went mad. And here in our text in Revelation, it says that Babylon has made all the nations the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, we need to link this back to what we understood earlier of the 144,000. The 144,000 represent uh, the one who are redeemed. The sexual purity of them represent faithfulness, devotion to God. And so here, when you understand that and you look at here, the world sexual fornication with Babylon is spiritual fortification, right? Powers, actually, powers are at work in seducing us today in committing spiritual adultery towards God. I mean, just think about it in our everyday life. How easy it is for a phone call, a text message, a social media pop-up, or even your own thoughts draw you away from prayer and quiet time from God every day. Will you choose to spend time with God or will you choose the world? The third angel shows the torment that await those who worship the beast. And of course, we see this as a continuation from chapter 13. But we can also see that the judgment here is much worse. You either, it comes down to facing the wrath of the beast or the wrath of God. You have to choose. And here we read the wrath of God is in full, right? It says, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. Now, I don't usually drink, so I went to Google about the alcohol content in drinks. And roughly it tells me, this. it says beer is about 5% alcohol, wine is about 13 to 20%, distilled spirits or hard liquor like vodka is about 50%. What is a drink that has 100% alcohol? Do you all know? Science students. Okay, actually there's no drink. Uh. No one can drink 100%, right? That's pure ethanol. It's actually used for, I think, industrial use, right? So here it actually says, you know, God's wrath is not diluted. It's not like beer. It's not like, it's not even like vodka, right? It's pure ethanol. It's full strength, 100%. So if you think about this, right, we have read about God's wrath in the Old Testament. We read about the flood. We read about the destruction of Gordon and Sumara. We read about the plagues in Egypt. And, or maybe we even look at the world today. We look at all the natural disasters, right? Hurricanes, earthquakes, famines, COVID-19. But these are all the diluted anger of God. We have not seen anything yet. Because the time is coming where God's wrath will be poured in full. And that's what the text is telling us today. And those who don't have 
God's name in them. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will not be any rest, no day nor night, for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of the beast. Now, actually when you read this passage, I'm sure for some, this may be discon, dis, discern, discon, <laughs> may be worrying to you, right? And it may not be something that you may take it lightly. It may be in the middle of something that sits well with you. Because there's this concept about an eternal hell, right? And all of us, we have loved ones. Loved ones who are not yet in the kingdom of God. And we worry for them. And I remember people sharing with me also some of their thoughts that, you know, if God is a gracious God, then suffering should not be eternal. That when a sinner is thrown into hell, God should just let the person suffer for a duration according to their sins. But after that, he should just let the soul die, right? And this is, by the way, anolism, right? But actually from this text, from this passage, from these few verses alone, it's very clear to us that hell is eternal. And God's wrath against them will never be exhausted because the punishment, in a sense, fits the crime. Sin is an offense on God's infinite holiness, and therefore it demands infinite punishment. And the nature of sin is such that it cannot be fully atoned in a finite quantity of time. The only thing that will save us from the eternal wrath of God is actually the eternal payment of Christ's life on the cross. For he drank the full cup of God's wrath against sin. Remember, we talk about it. We use the example, right? The, the, the US debt, right? The US debt is 30 trillion. And no one can pay for that except for someone with a bank account that has debt and more. And who has that bank account? Not us, not me, but Christ. Because He, as God, has that depth of grace that is overabundant, that is infinite. So if you trust in Jesus, He can drink that cup of wrath for you so that you don't have to drink it. So who will you choose? What will you choose? Are you going to trust Jesus to drink fully of God's wrath for you? because only he can, or you prefer to drink it yourself. If you do, you will be, you end up in a place that is not pleasant at all. If you today, if you have yet to place your faith and hope in him, you need to do it now. Trust him now. And finally, we come down to the harvest verses from verse 14 to 20. And here we see that God's judgment is seen in two agricultural images. Now, I won't give you the details, but I'll just touch on it broadly. Now, the first is that of the grain harvest. John looked and saw before him this white cloud, and seated on the cloud was like a son of man. And this is seen also in Daniel 7. And he receives an eternal kingdom from his God as he reaps the harvest. Now, in one hand, I think Jesus has already kind of received his eternal kingdom from God the Father when he came to earth, when he died on the cross, when he ascended and sits on the right hand of God. That's the kingdom that's already here. That's, in a sense, us, right? But as we often say, this is the already and not yet, right? The kingdom of God is already here, but it is not yet fully consummated. And so in this verse here, where the angel told the Son of Man to read, it means the angel is saying, it's time. It's time. It's time for the full consummation of the harvest. It's time for the eternal kingdom. And the harvest of the righteous are the people whose names are in the book of life. And as Jesus harvests his people, we will see a contrast from verse 17 to 19 with the people, with the harvest of the unrighteous. So if we look down in 17 to 20, we will see that God's wrath is poured out 
on the unrighteous in this imagery of a wine press. So in the first century, the wine press would have this huge container, right? And the grapes from the vineyard would be, all be plucked and left there. And then you have servant girls, they will kick off their shoes and then they will stomp on the grapes, right? And the bottom of the container, there will actually be small holes where the juice will be squeezed out, they'll be collected and then to be fermented into wine. So at any one time, you know, hundreds or thousands of, 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 of grapes are being crushed. And that's the imagery that God has given us. That people are being thrown in like little grapes and trample in the fury of God's wrath. Their blood, their grape juice rises to a great height and over 300 kilometers long. That's the thoroughness of God's wrath that's been poured out. Now, again, one of the misconceptions that maybe believers have is that we look at the Bible and we say, you know, it seems like there's a two different God, right? The God in the Old Testament is, is full of anger and wrath. He goes around punishing the nations. He punishes Israel when they don't obey. And yet when you come to the New Testament, Jesus is so mild and gentle. You know, it's like he's a much kinder God. You know, love your enemies, turn your other cheek and so on. But actually, when we look from the Old Testament to the New Testament, actually we see both God's wrath and God's mercy more clearly. Of course, in the New Testament, it's easy to say, right? We see very clearly, more clearly, the mercy of God through Jesus Christ, His Son, on the cross. But actually, we also see more clearly God's wrath. Because now, instead of the temporal judgment on the nations, what you have here is hell itself. But I suspect maybe one of the reasons why we don't see God's wrath more clearly in the New Testament is not because the scripture didn't tell us about it, but maybe because we don't believe in hell. Okay, we don't believe in hell. We don't believe in hell because I think what we fear most is not hell but we fear life here on earth. We fear a painful existence here on earth. I think we are more afraid of cancer. Maybe we are more afraid of our health. Maybe we are more afraid of the economy not doing well, you know, their careers not picking up, or that we don't have enough in our retirement fund. Maybe we are afraid of relationships that fail or would fail, a bad marriage or disobedient children. We are afraid of all this, but hell? Hmm. But today in John's vision, he tells us what is most important, heaven and hell. I think yes, in one way, yes, it's important to say that what we do here on earth matters. It's important to say how we raise our children, how we live, what our priorities in life, how we should provide for our families, about career progression, but at the end of the day, beyond all of that, there is still a heaven to gain and a hell to be feared. And this is the most important because it hinges on your relationship with God. Your biggest problem in life, your biggest challenge in life is not whether or not you have cancer, it's not whether or not you have health issues, it's not about your career, it's not about your family or finding a spouse, it's not about having children. It's not about retirement. It is God. Your biggest problem is God. Because of the nature of our sin. Because of our sins, we are justly under His wrath. And it's only His mercy, His grace, His sacrifice that He provides through His Son, Jesus, that allows us to be reconciled with Him. So God is your biggest problem because of your sin. And He's also your only solution to that problem. So unless you choose now to trust Him, unless you trust the gospel truth, the objective truth, you will be thrown into hell. So choose. Are you going to choose to face the wrath of the beast as a Christian? Or will you choose to face the wrath of God 
as someone who opposes him. Are you ready to be harvested? And are you ready for the end of the world to come? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today. You're reminding us of the urgency of being ready to meet you and to be harvested into your kingdom. And Holy Spirit, guide us to live out the message that we have heard and to share it with others. Help us to be faithful to you in all areas of our life, including our thoughts, our words, our actions. And may you give us the strength to persevere until the very end. For we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.